or beer mugs, paper ruffling or everything else. And you can ask questions already during the talk uh, by using the chat. Uh, you can also, we can collect your questions, but you can also um, just write in that you have, you want to ask a question or you can ask the question yourself afterwards, like as just like a word contribution. And please note, we will, uh, I just mentioned this before, we will um, also stream it live via um, YouTube. I think it started already, yes. And the presentation will be available afterwards uh, on our homepage. So, this is our second event. Last time uh, we had uh, Dr. Bia Maas here from the Boku Wien. Today we have Monica Rivera. And Monica is going to introduce her. So welcome everyone. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for being here. And thank you, uh, Claudia, for the introduction. And thank you, Monique, for being willing to wake up early and give this talk to us today. And uh, so, yeah, we are starting this series, um, Ag Science on Tap, where we wanted to have um, speakers come from all different um, yeah, all different disciplines in the agricultural sciences. And this summer semester, we want to focus on many inspirational women that are doing groundbreaking research in, in agriculture. And uh, just to briefly introduce uh, Monique, she studied at the University of Delaware and is originally from the, U the East Coast in the US, if I am not mistaken. And uh, she studied entomology and plant sciences. She then went on to do her PhD or master's and PhD um, in North Carolina and then in Rutgers in New Jersey. And this was also in entomology. And then she did a postdoc in um, the University of Florida, where I think she got very uh, engaged in some of the um, pe agricultural pests as well in, in Florida. And our current um, uh, HEF director was also in Florida. So maybe he will also drop in in a bit and can share his, uh, his experience as well. And since, let's see, 2018, uh, Monique has been leading a research group of uh, extension specialists as well at the University of California in Riverside. Uh, and they are focusing a lot on citrus pests and helping citrus growers in the California and the greater Los Angeles. I guess it's better for us in Europe who have very little geography maybe of California and the greater uh, Los Angeles region. And um, we're really excited to have Monique here today. And um, with that, I will yeah say thank you and looking forward to your talk. Okay, so I'm gonna do the whole screen share thing here. Um, I'm gonna try this out. You guys are gonna have to tell me if it's if it goes full screen or if it does not. So, do you see pre presenter view or the full screen? You see preventer, presenter mode or view, yeah. So if you swap it, maybe. Yes, I just have to find that button. Okay, nailed it. Looks good. All right, so I'll get started. So I called this uh, talk Research for Immediate Implementation, working at the interface of research and agriculture in the United States. Uh, because I wanted to explain a little bit about what I do. Um, a, an extension specialist is not really something that is widely known around the world. The, the U.S. has a really unique system. So I'm going to try to delve into that and give you guys a little bit of a background on what I do and uh, exactly how that position com came to be, essentially. So that came to be through the land grant university system. Um, and I'll go over that pretty much in depth, trying to explain to you what that means. Um, and then I'll also explain what is extension. So like I said, this, uh, to my knowledge, is something that is present in the United States and can be present in other places in a certain way. But I think that the land grant university system and how extension is done in the US is fairly unique, to my knowledge. Um, and then, of course, what do I do and what is my role? How do I engage in interacting with growers and uh, not just growers, but the public and also uh, academic communities? 
Um, and then how research and extension kind of work together to help serve farmers and overall uh, increase food production sustainability. So let's talk about the land grant university system. Ultimately, this was signed into law by Abraham Lincoln, who um, was one of our first and most important presidents in terms of uh, legislation and shaping the nation. Um, so the first thing that helped establish this network uh, was the Merrill Act. Um, and what this did was it essentially uh, established state universities in every state in the United States. Um, and then there were subsequent acts that were signed that were related to this in 1890 and 1994. Um, in 1890, uh, this established state universities that were also known as historically black colleges and universities or HBCUs. And then in 1994, there was also a network of uh, Native American colleges and universities developed. So with this act, every state was given around 30,000 acres or 12,140 hectares to establish a state university. Um, and in some cases, I think it's important to mention that this land was removed by violence from um, Native people. Um, so that will always be a part of the story here. Um, but there was actually a good intention here uh, overall, which is that each state was then provided with the university with the mission to teach and to research and to serve those communities. Um, and then finally, uh, what really sort of married the university system to agricultural research is the Hatch Act of 19, 1987, not 1997. That would be a very new thing. Um, but this established some experimental uh, stations. What this means is it's just a unit of land with the intention that uh, you're supposed to do agricultural research on it. And this still exists to that to this day. And then finally, uh, in 1914, uh, this is what established agricultural extension. So this is the smith lieber Act. And what this does is it um, provides federal funding for people uh, studying agriculture and nutrition and, and lots of other very different things that are meant to directly serve communities. Um, and so the idea was is that not only were these state universities going to exist in each state, but there would be people with a purpose to interface and communicate the research and knowledge to the communities in which those uh, state universities were placed. So what that really looks like now um, is like this map. So in every single state you have a, uh, the 1862s are the uh, initial establishment of the state universities. And then you have the 1890s, which are the HBCUs and the 1994s, which are the Native American colleges. So as you can see in every single state, uh, you do have a university. And of course with, uh, let's use California as an example. So you've got the University of California, but California is huge. So what this actually looks like is the first one was started at UC Berkeley and that's the original land grant, but also um, you have UC Davis and UC Riverside. And those are the three land grants within, within the 10 uh, campus UC system. And, uh, what actually happens is that there's actually small little uh, research stations and also um, plots of land throughout the state that are actually for research and a lot of them really aimed at agricultural research. So that's how uh, a single state university kind of distributes its presence throughout the state is by having these um, smaller areas, usually called research and education centers, uh, throughout the state, which kind of mirror the university and give people a more local uh, home base in which to interact with local communities in that specific region. So the original mission of the land grants was uh, to teach agriculture and also laughably military tactics, um, mechanical arts, meaning, you know, any sort of like knowledge that you would need to build things in a sort of factory setting, and then also classical studies. And so the real goal here was to educate the working class. And there's been some strong arguments that suggest that uh, this could have a lot to do with uh, the United States accelerated pace of um, development and also success and in innovation. So the United States, as you saw in the last figure, is just it's just a huge landmass. So I think um, in the very early uh, government, uh, they were trying to figure out how to deal with this. And I think that was what the land grant was approaching, was how to provide education and services to all regions in that landmass, rather than having 
the urbanized and developed areas accelerate at such a higher pace than the rural areas. So this really unified everybody in having access to education, not just in those urban and developed regions. So the ag experiment stations were really meant to do, do practical research to advance agriculture. So the United States, like most other uh, countries and historically humans, starts out as very uh, agrarian. So agriculture plays an, an, an immense role to the uh, colonization and survivalship of the colonists that were here. So as those uh, techniques and uh, ways to grow food, uh, as our knowledge sort of increased in the US, I think it was really important to have those experimental research stations, especially without the internet and, and all the connectivity we have now. Um, and you know, those stations provided, uh, they could do local, regional, which is super important in agriculture, experiments that could serve that growing population. So that was really the original intention of those ag experiment stations, and they really function the same way today. Not much has really changed. And then, of course, there's extension. Um, and that's, a, I think it's a kind of an odd word. Um, I think of it as to extend, meaning uh, really you're trying to extend information that's developed at the university and then um, deliver it to the constituents or your local community. Um, so that's really what extension is. I do find it a weird word, and I, I will discuss that a little bit more about what that really means now. But what I would call that is sort of the original science communication in the United States. This was um, very intentional that the information from research would be disseminated or communicated to uh, surrounding communities. So what is extension overall? It's kind of a, uh, an interesting thing. I, I think of it as, uh, as American as apple pie, as they say. Um, and what this means is it's really about developing relationships with local communities. So if you have a local community that, uh, let's say for me, grows citrus, um, interacting with uh, growers, not only growers, legislators, um, and other researchers to find out uh, how to best grow the fruit how to um, best do pest management. Um, and then there's so many other facets of extension that, uh, that are outside of agriculture that don't really get discussed, which I'll go over a little bit uh, in a couple slides. But overall extension in America, I mean, when I was looking up photos of this, uh, this is really what it looks like. And this is what it looks like in every single state. Um, you will have somebody out in the field talking to a group of people about research on a crop. Um, I've lived in now, I think four or five different states and it, it looks like this in every state. Uh, of course, the pandemic has really changed that, um, but this will always, I think, be the format. Um, it's very much so, uh, feels very community, community oriented. And the longer you stay in a role in extension, you'll start to know every single person that shows up at, at any given meeting. Um, and, and have a real relationship with them and, and sometimes even collaborate on research projects. So it's very uh, interesting and fun thing to do. And I really feel thankful for the opportunity to be able to serve uh, in this role. So at University of California, like I was saying, extension is goes far beyond just agriculture and pest management, which you can see here in the top center. Um, it's so much more than that. We have um, also working nutritionists that work with um, low income and at risk families to try to, they have a whole programming um, that is how to, uh, let's say they're on welfare, they're receiving money from the government to pay for food. There's a whole programming on how to best spend that and how to best make it uh, go as far as possible, including um, cooking lessons. Uh, they really get deeply involved in the community. Um, Innovation and economic development. I would say that uh, another thing that it can be a part of extension would be agricultural econom economists. And so what they'll do is they'll take, um, you know, local uh, economic values, for example, the value of the land, um, the crop market, and then they'll put together um, personal farm economic profiles for folks to try to strategize what they should and shouldn't be growing or um, how to best utilize their land. Uh, it's really a, an interesting service that they provide 
And they also provide that service for regulation, for regulatory purposes, and then also uh, just broadly to sort of analyze if somebody's suggesting, oh, you should use this new tool and it costs X dollars, they will explain how that actually fits into um, the actual personal economies of farmers. Um, so it's, it's really helpful as somebody who studies pest management and suggests, you know, oh, maybe you should, you know, use this tool. Um, it's the ec economist that will tell you whether that's practical or not. And so that, that really creates a team effort uh, for uh, people working in pest management uh, with the economist to try to best recommend what makes the most sense. So when you see yard and garden, there's actually in each state a program called the Master Gardeners. And so what the Master Gardeners do is um, they become Master Gardeners through intensive training where they train on all kinds of, you know, backyard growing plants, different kinds of plants, and also growing backyard food. Um, and they do all of this coursework till they're sort of uh, anointed as uh, master gardeners. And then what they do is they serve as volunteers. So they will go out and table events, meaning that they'll stand behind a table at an event and, and provide local information about what you can and can't grow. And sometimes also about how to prevent uh, insect pests or also plant diseases. And then what's really important in California, as you probably know from the news, is the Environment and Natural Resources Group. So uh, what I found out is that uh, we actually have people in California that do um, similar to what I do. So they'll be uh, in extension, but their real purpose is to try to help people be more prepared for wildfires. So if they have a lot of land, Sometimes these people will actually go out to that land in the community and help them do what's called prescribed burning. So if you can do a controlled pre-burn on land, um, it can make uh, it can prevent wildfire from spreading to that land. So these people are all, all over the place. It's not just agriculture. It's just uh, land protection. It can even be rangelands. So um, there's these huge blocks of area where uh, people will graze their animals and managing that. So all the stuff that comes with land management, uh, they're there from forestry to uh, all the way to range management and wildfire. That's a really dynamic arm of extension at the University of California. And then 4-H and families. So similar to the nutrition, 4-H uh, is actually... It's another thing where I call it as, as American as apple pie. What it is, is it's, it has to do with um, students get trained at a very young age on agriculture and stuff like home economics, um, and then really practical skills like sewing and canning. Um, and so this is available in every state in the United States. It's not really well talked about because it tends to be more uh, more of a thing in rural communities where there's a natural interest towards those types of things. Um, so that's just an example of just how dynamic all of this is when it comes to the federal funding and, and how it's used by each of the states. Um, these are really uh, typical ways that it's used. I think in California, the environment and natural resources thing is a bit different, but I'm hoping to present here just how dynamic and how this spreads over such a broad uh, amount of topics to apply to a certain community. So like I kind of mentioned, extension is changing uh, and that's been accelerated by the pandemic. Uh, there's been an adoption of digital technology. So anything from, you know, giving a webinar to developing an app for your phone. I mean, this is really uh, the way things are going. Um, and I think that with the internet, you have a much faster movement of information generally. So what I see more frequently now is that extension programs in other states collaborating across the state lines to try to figure out what works best and what is specifically different between those states when it comes to a certain cropping system. Of course, we also are having a generational change. And so overall, the way of accessing information is just changing overall. Um, and that's happening faster in some places and slower in others. So for example, here in California, our citrus growers are ready to adopt the newest, brightest and best technology, where in uh, Texas, my colleague Mamudu Sedamu, his uh, set of growers there are all mostly 50 plus and they do not like accessing internet, 
the internet uh, and using the digital technology for extension. So knowing your audience and knowing who you're interacting with is really key to understanding how to communicate with that audience. Um, but overall, I would say agriculture is adopting new technology quickly. Uh, this is really the case in California, which is the uh, biggest ag producing state in the United States. Uh, people are hungry for new technology and they want to implement sustainable technologies. It's almost as if they cannot come up with them quick enough. Um, so I definitely feel thankful to work with a group that is that interested in, in adopting new technology because it certainly makes my job more exciting. So extension in sort of this digital world can look a certain way. So um, what used to be like a book that would come out regularly. Um, so you would have say the citrus pest management guidelines. Now all of that is online and updated in real time. So this is something I'm responsible for updating. And so what I do and what my research sort of informs is this uh, integrated pest management guidelines. And so what you're essentially doing is suggesting ways to manage or to best manage citrus throughout the year. And this also um, mostly has to do for me with insects, but this can also be seen from the horticultural perspective in terms of fertilizers, or also from the disease management perspective in terms of um, any sort of plant disease that might affect the citrus. Uh, the other thing that we have that has taken off quite a bit has been YouTube. Um, and so when we do these uh, ag expert talks, uh, they do get posted to YouTube. Um, and so you're not losing that information. It all gets sort of collated. Um, and then, of course, you know, this just creates a digital landscape where if someone missed that talk, they can go back and watch it. And it's not just like, uh, you know, an informational standpoint that happened at one certain point in time, like those uh, field meetings that I was showing you. Um, if you didn't attend, uh, then you would definitely not be receiving that information. But in the digital landscape, that information can be passed on quite easily and, and made really apparent. So this, this is really changing the landscape of how people utilize uh, information that's been in, developed by extension people. And I'm excited to see where this goes ultimately. So discussing what particular careers are available in extension. And, and so this is how those federal funds are doled out to the United States and all the different states uh, use them differently, but these are the typical uh, careers that are available in extension. Uh, one would be a farm advisor or county agent. So these are sort of like me, like an extension specialist, but they're really um, based in a very specific local community. So usually this is at the county level um, and they can deal with anything from urban agriculture to small farms or to just specific regional commodities. Um, and then you also have academic coordinators. And so sometimes um, these people will be involved in specific extension programs. And what they do is essentially administration, uh, but they also design and assist with that programming overall. And then program directors. So program directors oversee and really are the mind behind various uh, specific sectors or divisions. So for example, there's a program director that deals with wildfire. Um, there's another program director that deals with uh, um, water use. Um, so that person kind of helps design how they're gonna speak about things or uh, you know, works with an academic coordinator to sort of put on extension programming. So I'm of course an extension specialist. And so I'll explain a little bit about what that means. So an extension specialist almost always, well, always has a PhD and has uh, worked extensively generally in agriculture and is interested in applied research. Um, and the research programs, you know, depending on what job you get. So for example, my position is extension specialist of subtropical crops. Um, I work with the industries that are relevant to that particular crop. Um, and I also work across disciplines to answer questions for the industry. So I might work with that agricultural econo economist or um, someone who is a plant pathologist. So working across disciplines to answer complex questions in this particular area that I'm working in. Um, and then for me, interdisciplinary work in my laboratory is really important. And I really like to investigate the gray area between basic and applied science. So taking uh, basic biological information and understanding how it might be applied to manage a crop, 
I really feel like this is my niche in all of this. And so this really feeds back with an extension program. Um, you develop research in your laboratory, and then of course you extend it, but it's, it's also more complicated than that because you need to also be sharing the work of others. Um, what you're trying to do is get your community, in this case, the state of California for me, um, the best and most cutting edge information so that they can use this and advance their production system to the best of their abilities. Overall, our goal, I think, within Extension and the overall UC system when it comes to agriculture is to help industries be more sustainable, whether that's through using less water, less insecticides, um, better controlling plant disease so they have less loss, um, or controlling the damage by insects so that there's less economic loss. These things are all very important. Um, and so I guess the main point I'm trying to explain here is that when you're an extension specialist, you run a full research program. So you have a lab with postdocs and graduate students and also technicians. And then your extension program is essentially, it's work that you're doing with your local community, but also with your broader academic community. So bringing in speakers and people that work on things that are relevant to your industry and having them share that information. This is, uh, this is how that ultimately looks in terms of um, how you would design a program that includes both. Um, so what do I do and how did I get here? So I'm going to share this picture. This was from the very first summer that I ever worked in agriculture. Um, and I am scouting a peach orchard in southern Delaware. And I would say that, uh, you know, I did not get anywhere for this position without mentorship. And I think mentorship is a buzzword that's thrown around that doesn't actually give people the idea of what this is. Um, so... Ultimately, there's a couple things. You have to find somebody that you feel like embodies what you can see yourself doing. And then secondarily, you have to have a relationship with that person so that they want to mentor you. So mentoring you is just providing advice on strategy for how you can get to where you want to go. And so for me, um, in this picture uh, was the first summer, I think it was 2006. And I was working for my initial and still one of the very most important mentors, uh, Joanne Whalen, who was an extension specialist. Um, and I think it's really important to note that you don't need to be raised on a farm to study agriculture. Um, I think that if this is something you're interested in and you find yourself engaged in that, I don't think anybody should feel shy about being interested in agriculture. You don't need to have grown up picking corn or so uh, to study this or to enjoy it. I think sometimes this can really hold people back in thinking that, oh, you know, this isn't really my thing. Well, we all came from agriculture. Uh, chances are you have someone in your uh, family history that has done something with agriculture. And I do feel like overall, it is normal and natural to have a draw towards agriculture. So feeling invalidated because you didn't grow up on a farm, I think that is something that everyone should try their best to get over. Uh, especially if this is something you're interested in. Um, and then overall extension is really just about caring about people. Um, it's building relationships with people and getting involved in communities and doing your best to try to take care of those people with information and knowledge and, and showing them that the more that they know, the more empowered they are on their own. So you can't really make a choice if you don't know the options. Um, and so that's really the point of extension is giving people all the different options and having them figure out what they want to try and then eventually figure out what works best for them. It's not necessarily about telling people what to do. Um, it's really about helping them to meet their goals. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about what happens in my lab, what I study. Um, and right now, the real focal uh, insect of my lab is the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, and so this is a pest of citrus. And what's the most important about it is that it spreads a bacterial disease of citrus called Huanglong Bing. This is a bacterial disease that is absolutely lethal to the tree. And it is just now starting, well, it's been in California since 2012, but I would say that the disease progression is taking off. They still haven't found it in commercial citrus in California, but it is spreading through backyard citrus. So HLB, which I'll call Huanglong Bing, this bacterial disease for short, what does this do? 
So as Monica mentioned, before I came to California, I was in Florida and I was working as a postdoc. And I'm going to show you some photos of Florida, which has absolutely been ravaged by HLB that are direct from my cell phone when I lived there. So this is a totally a very common site driving through California um, on the ridge, which is where most of the citrus is grown. And you can see that all these trees along the edge are just completely dead and or on their last legs. So that's really what HLB looks like at its maximum. Um, it is going to kill the tree and it does this by an internal girdling of the tree. Um, so the disease itself causes the internal uh, transport elements or the phloem to build starchiness inside of those tubules that are flowing throughout the tree, which prevents nutrients from moving up and down the tree, which for um, a plant of this size is just absolutely lethal. They really need to have that mobility to move nutrients around. Um, and in, here in this second photo, uh, the point here is that looking at the fruit. So these are supposed to be oranges and you can see that they look both yellow and green. This is not what an orange looks like, but this is what HLB does to oranges growing on HLB infected trees. Um, so what you'll uh, find is if you were to pick this fruit off the tree is that it is sour. Um, the inside of it will look a bit lopsided and the seeds will be aborted. So um, these are not tasty fruits. They are indeed just, uh, did the result of disease. They're just, they're not the same citrus that you would want to enjoy at home. Um, and of course, in total, this is what a tree might look like as it's heading towards its decline. This is super common in Cal or not in California, thank God. Uh, in Florida, this is most of the citrus, uh, like something like 97% is infected with this pathogen. And so what the growers have to do there is just constantly battle the overall decline of what they're uh, growing there. So I like to use this uh, figure by Grow Intel to sort of give you the magnitude of loss that's occurred in Florida. Um, so essentially they've lost about 50% of their overall orange production. Um, and the overall uh, production in Florida is worth more than 9 billion, that's what it's estimated. So they are definitely just losing money at all times because just the specific yield of the individual trees has just gone down by so much that it takes so many more inputs to manage citrus in a way that is uh, going to produce fruit. So this is a really um, big struggle for them and they are sort of hanging on, uh, hoping, I think, for some sort of genetically modified uh, or tolerant by normal breeding standards, uh, some type of cultivar that will be resistant or, you know, some way of managing the psyllid, which spreads the pathogen that is going to eliminate the spread of the disease. But it is very difficult. And there has been um, so many millions of dollars uh, invested in research to try to solve this issue. And it has just, we've just not come up with a solution. So um, I can answer more questions about that later, but I'm gonna push forward just in case uh, time, I think I'm okay. Um, so citrus production regions of the world. So it's not produced, uh, it is produced throughout the world and the pathogen is present in almost everywhere citrus is produced. So Australia um, does not have uh, the, insect and the pathogen. Um, same with Europe, actually. So the Mediterranean climate there, they don't seem to have um, in this area here any sort of uh, issue yet. But everyone knows that this is, this is under threat. Uh, we're globalized. Things are moving all across the world. Um, and so in the United States and in South America, everywhere where citrus is produced, they have this pressure of Wang Bing. California, it's just starting to take off. It is present already in Mexico. Um, and then of course, all throughout the Caribbean and Florida and then uh, South Texas where citrus is produced. Uh, the disease is actually just completely endemic at this point. Um, same thing with uh, China and also, you know, we're still trying to figure out what's going to happen with these Mediterranean climates because it hasn't taken off in California the way it did in Florida. Um, and I think Spain in particular is watching California to see how this all happens um, because that would be another, you know, they could keep this under eradication, but should the psyllid show up, it's likely to see HLB follow shortly. Um, 
and California would have the most similar climate. So we will see what happens there. But overall, I want to make the point that when I'm addressing this pathogen and this disease, it's not just about saving the citrus interest industry in California. It's way more deep and way more human than that, to be quite honest. Um, California has as many backyard citrus trees as commercial. So that should give you an idea of just how present this plant is throughout backyards. And um, people that were raised here and grew up here, you know, they grew up with a citrus tree in their backyard. They feel a certain way, a certain attachment to citrus. It is a prominent part of the landscape. And not only that, historically has been hugely important. Um, so California, and in many ways, Southern California was settled uh, for citrus production. Um, and in particular, Riverside, uh, the parent navel, which all uh, navel oranges come from, is here in Riverside. So Riverside is, has, is the heart of the initial start of citrus production. In fact, at UC Riverside, we have the original uh, citrus experiment station, which is literally about maybe a thousand feet from me right now. Um, so this is really huge in the establishment of California and the success and um, of Southern California. And if you're interested in this from a more humanistic perspective as well, I would suggest reading this book called Oranges by John McPhee. Uh, this really tells the history of oranges. Uh, John McPhee was a writer for The New Yorker, which is a magazine here in the United States. Uh, they do a lot of long form journalism. And he is somebody who just gets interested in a really specific thing and will do a really deep dive on all the historical knowledge and how it exists as it does today. So he did this with oranges. So it's a really fascinating book. And I think it gives um, a lot of background for the value of citrus and how people relate to citrus, especially in historic times. Um, it was always seen as uh, a gift or a prize or something highly valuable. And I think that's kind of stuck in our minds and um, overall why in Southern California and, and California largely, there is this uh, intense appreciation for citrus, not only for the, from the perspective of the industry, which is huge uh, multi-billion dollar industry, but just people's way that they interact with the fruit uh, is really special. And I think that people feel very emotionally connected to the fruit because they grew up with a citrus tree in their backyard. And overall, when we try to save citrus from this lethal pathogen, that's that's really the goal there is to keep California's, um, this sort of ambiance or uh, relationship with citrus uh, in a backyard sense and you know shared between families. This is what we're trying to hold on to. It's not just about uh, the bottom dollar and saving the industry. It's also about people and how they interact with uh, the, the, the fruit, the tree and their own experience. So there's even more to this story. Um, as, you, as I mentioned, the citrus is a huge backyard uh, fruit tree. Um, and so food security. Um, in Southern California, we are blessed with the ability to be able to grow a bunch of food in our backyards. Um, but this is really even more important in Los Angeles because of food security. We want people to have that empowerment of being able to grow food in their backyard and so again, protecting citrus is not just about the industry, it's about this too. Um, and food security, if you're not aware of what this term means, is it's really just the state of having reliable access to sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food. So really what this is talking about, fruits and vegetables, um, of course, at the local corner store, you can get any sort of chips and packaged and processed food, but it can be very difficult in some areas of the United States to access fresh food. Um, and so food security really is a term that tries to address that and being able to have access to those, those foods. So Los Angeles County, which is uh, highlighted here on the left in red, is the largest population of food insecure people in the US. And about 30% of low income individuals in Los Angeles County are food insecure. And so that's, you know, again, the human side of why we are doing research to try to help this situation. And this is really what my lab's doing. This is what we always try to keep in mind in everything that we do do in the lab. So I'm really going to give you three examples. Um, and this is meant to show you um, how research can serve uh, solving these issues and how um, at the end of the talk, I'll show you a little bit about how we also engage with uh, not just growers, but the public and also um, the broader academic and university community. 
So first I'm gonna show you an example of basic biology of an insect flight behavior and how that can be really important uh, to solving something like the HLB pathosystem where you have an insect vector. Um, and then I'm going to discuss a project that we have ongoing in the lab where we are trying to understand the biological dynamics of this Wang Long Bing disease in the field by looking at the insects as carriers and how they carry the pathogen um, and their actual phenotype if we can find any relationship between the phenotype and them carrying the pathogen. Um, and then I'll also show an example of a field tool that we're working on developing for repelling Asian citrus psyllid from feeding. So um, I will get deeper into these three things in the next couple slides and hope to show you an example of how you can do research to try to address situation from multiple angles. So flight behavior. Um, so specifically of the Asian citrus psyllid, uh, this is key for transmission of the pathogen. So the Asian citrus psyllid is a piercing sucking insect. And what that means is that it has uh, needle-like mouth parts where it actually will suck on the juices of the plant, in particular the phloem juices. And the phloem is where nutrients are spread up and down the plant. Um, and so the longer that they feed on a plant um, and them having access to plants, uh, this is how the pathogen gets transmitted. So which, uh, the adult insects would move among citrus trees and this would drive spread of the pathogen. So we need to understand how flight can change in this Mediterranean climate that we're in where we haven't, this hasn't really been an insect that's been studied in Mediterranean climates. Um, for example, in Florida, uh, you have not a Mediterranean climate. It's more of a tropical climate where you have higher temperatures, but it's a super wet conditions. Um, and so this is a presentation or this data is pulled from a recently published paper uh, by the lead author's postdoc in my lab, um, postdoc in my lab um, where we were looking at flight behavior and trying to simulate the Mediterranean climate. So what we did is we built a temperature controlled flight mill. Um, and what this looks like is essentially uh, we'll do this magnified cir circle on the left here first. So you're basically holding fiber optic cables. Uh, this is a fiber optic cable, this uh, horizontal um, line, and I'm wondering if I can get, let me see if I can find that. Um, I guess I won't mess with it. Uh, I was going to see if I could get a pointer just because that might help quite a bit here. Um, so essentially you have two magnets um, that are essentially uh, tensioning a metal fiber, which in our case was a sewing needle. Um, and through the eye of the sewing needle is this fiber optic cable, right? And on one side, we would have a dead Asian citrus psyllid to counterbalance the live Asian citrus psyllid as it flies and it spins. Um, and then we would record the amount of rotations and you know, basically extrapolate from those rotations and the distance of this wand. Uh, to estimate the flight distance traveled. So when it came to building a temperature controlled flight mill, what we essentially did was take the guts out of a toaster oven. Um, so the heating elements from a toaster oven and then uh, build a glass chamber and then connected those heating elements to um, a unit that could control the intensity of their output. Um, and so essentially what we would do is fly these insects in this little flight mill here um, and heat this unit to various different levels to simulate the Mediterranean climate. Because the real difference between Florida and California is that Florida's uh, heat is buffered by the humidity. So in Florida, you'll see it get up to you know, 95, 99, but in Southern California, in particular in Riverside, we can see temperatures up to 110 or 115. So uh, getting up to the mid forties, speaking in Celsius. So we tested a bunch of different temperatures. So 26 Celsius was our standard or optimum. And then we went all the way up to 46 degrees Celsius. Uh, we also looked at this in low and high humidity to disentangle if um, the humidity was having a significant effect on their movement. We also evaluated two separate flight, flight parameters. So flight capacity was distance and speed traveled and then flight propensity. So propensity to engage in flight or if they started flying under those conditions. Um, and then uh, this, I haven't given you the background for this, but in the next example, I will go over this in depth. We only use the blue color morph uh, because what's been found is that that's really the distance flyer of the Asian citrus psyllid. 
And so we wanted to investigate specifically with those long range flyers, how temperature affects them. And then once we had the insect attached to the fiber optic cable, um, we would sort of define the insects as non-flyers, short flyers, or long flyers. So non-flyers were insects that didn't fly within the first five minutes of being attached to the wand. Uh, short flyers flew less than 60 seconds and long flyers flew more than 60 seconds. So the results of uh, what we found are here in this figure. And so what you're looking at along the x-axis on the bottom are the different temperatures and then the duration in minutes on the y-axis going up. So I wanna point out that there are some differences between the y-axis. So um, essentially it is important to note that um, on our top A and B in low and high humidity, we're looking at total flight duration. So on the y-axis, you're looking at duration in minutes. And then in the bottom half of the figures, uh, figures C and D, you're looking at distance flown. So this has to do with meters. Um, so you're looking at meters flown. And what essentially overall we're looking at here is um, in the top, uh, the figures also separated down the middle. So you have low humidity on the left-hand side and high humidity on the right-hand side. And so overall, the results that we found in terms of the model that we ran is that temperature was the most significant factor here. Uh, humidity and humidity by temperature or the interaction between the two were not statistically significant. So temperature really is the dominant um, abiotic factor here that is playing a role in uh, changing the insect's flight behavior. Um, and as we uh, predicted and as we know to be true, 26 degrees Celsius was the most favorable temperature. And you can see in all the figures, the white bar um, is always the highest, um, statistically speaking, as well. And so what you also see overall between total flight duration and distance flown overall for all figures is that the distance and the flight duration significantly decrease at 43 degrees centigrade. And what we mean by uh, decrease here is almost completely not happening. Um, so there's some sort of uh, threshold there, um, but we were happy to see that what we thought to be true based on our observations in the field was also true is that as those temperatures go up, these insects don't want to fly as much because they're risking um, desiccation and um, even in the high humidity. Um, and it's also just risky to have that flight behavior go on for any sort of amount of time when it comes to uh, movement in high temperatures. Uh, just from a biological standpoint, of course, we don't like to move a whole lot when it's hot outside and insects are the same. Um, I think that water loss would be the biggest concern, even in high humidity. Um, with the additional heat that they are generating internally by flying. So in conclusion, um, we saw flight capacity function as um, function with temperature. Um, and what we found is that at 18 degrees centigrade, that's when you really have flight starting. 26 to 32 was uh, them flying at their maximum capacity. And then over 32 degrees centigrade, you start to see the decrease in capacity. Um, and then at or equal to 43 degrees centigrade, you're gonna see no long flights from these insects. And that's a temperature that's commonly experienced during the day here in Southern California, and even more so in, in the Central Valley where most citrus is produced. Um, overall, what we found is that humidity from a statistical standpoint does not seem to affect flight capacity. Um, so I'm gonna move quickly into this regional scouting project that we have ongoing right now. Um, and so the objectives of this were to determine the percent of HLB positive psyllids in commercial groves. So we haven't found HLB in commercial groves in California. And um, essentially we do not want to find it, but we also don't know if it's there because we're not sampling. So this, the intention of this project is to figure out if it's there and what percent of the psyllids there have it. And then overall, this data will help us understand the phenology or the presence over time of the HLB positive psyllids. And hopefully we tend, intend to determine the number of ACP uh, color morphs in the field. So they have three different color morphs um, and I'm going to show them here. So these are the underside abdomens of the insect. So we call uh, this one all the way on the left-hand side, the blue, green, 
uh, color morph, and then in the middle, white gray, and then on the end, orange yellow. Um, and these are much more obvious in person under a microscope. These photos are kind of blurry. But why do we care about these color morphs? Well, it's actually, um, the color is really derived from pigmented cells of the fat body or the liver of the insect. So if you were to uh, dissect an insect, you would find all of these white sort of filamentous uh, fibers in there. And that's uh, how, uh, given their exoskeleton, how they basically have a liver. They have these sort of um, protrusions all over their body that absorb and try to detoxify uh, whatever is in there that should not be. Um, and so that blue green color in particular is uh, from the pigmented cells of the fat body. And this is in its most, uh, when that, uh, that pigmentation and the function is really good, uh, you will see the blue green coloration. And, and that's why we think they're really great long distance flyers. They might just be overall more healthy insects. Um, and previous research has shown that they acquire less of sea lass or the bacterium that causes HLB than the gray or orange color morph. So uh, what we think is that would lead to less overall inoculation. And there's also been found that the females that are blue green are heavier. So I think overall the health of the insect is much better if it's a blue or blue green insect. However, with the gray or orange insects, uh, what previous research, research has found is that they have a higher symbiont load. Um, so what that means is stuff like Wolbachia in their stomach. Um, basically imagine like your gut microbe community, they have a higher amount of that variation of symbionts. And what we think is that that also helps to drive a higher level of the bacterial pathogen because um, the bacterial pathogen has not been able to be isolated and cultured uh, without other bacterial uh, species or types alongside it. So we think that that higher symbiont load can drive higher levels of ba the bacterial pathogen. And that's what they have found for those color morphs. So of course that would be important. Um, and then another thing that's been found previously is that the orange color morph is more susceptible to insecticides. They have less detox activity. Again, those pigmented cells of the fat body are not in their uh, prime or ideal state. Um, and it's important to know if these particular uh, color morphs vary between the year. There's a possibility that if we can find a difference that maybe this could influence management overall. So we are looking into all of this. And so overall, what we're doing is that we have these three sampling regions and we have five sentinel citrus groves in each of them. So um, five groves in Riverside, San Bernardino, five in San Diego County and five in Ventura. So 15 sentinel sites total. Um, we're doing month a systematic sample of whole insect communities, meaning we're basically taking in a giant insect vacuum and vacuuming all the insects off of the trees. Uh, we're going through those samples, pulling out uh, the Asian citrus psyllids and also um, identifying all the other insects in those bags. Also we'll pull a uh, flush or young uh, leaves off of the tree that have nymphs or the immature stage of the psyllid if we are able to find them. Um, and then we sort the samples, like I said, uh, we actually will pull out all the Asian citrus psyllids and uh, sort them by abdomen color. And then we send them out for processing for uh, testing to see if they have Huang Long Bing. So what this totals is about 13,680 samples processed for HLB over two years. That's what we're hoping to achieve here. Um, and this project's been running since the beginning of this year. Um, so we've had maybe, I think, five samples um, and we still have not found any HLB positive psyllid. So that is a good thing uh, for California, but maybe not the best for this research project. So we'll see what happens. Um, and then launching into uh, the development of a tool for the field. So this is a particle film called kaolin here on the right hand side. This is a, a citrus tree sprayed with it, a young citrus tree. So it almost is a white coating. Um, and so typically these are sprayed to reflect UV light it's almost like a sunscreen for plants. Uh, here we have really high heat intensity um, and sun intensity, and it can sometimes burn or slow the photosynthesis or production of the plant. And so it, uh, these are basically used as a sunblock for the plants, especially uh, in desert citrus. And so this original kaolin uh, clay or surround, as it's called commercially, is white in color. And so what we're doing is we're trying to uh, convert this into the best insect repellent that it could possibly be. So our intention or what we're doing is changing the color of the treatment to create a visual, a visually repellent treatment. 
Um, and so what we're doing is adding red dye. And so you can see here, uh, you can see some white trees and then we've also got some pink trees. So we're not just painting these trees pink for fun. Um, we are actually, there's a biologically relevant uh, thing going on here. And so the dye, uh, when you add it to the white clay, uh, changes the spectrum of light reflected. Um, and so this red dye is um, reducing the ultraviolet and blue light, which is attractive to Asian citrus psyllid. And so that's exactly what we're finding in the field. Um, so here um, is Orchard Farm. This is in Ventura County. These are young trees. And what you're looking at here is our untreated control all the way on the right on the x-axis, uh, the pink clay and then the white clay. Um, and so this is tap sampling. So we're looking at adults here. And so what happens is you essentially beat the tree and look at how many insects come off. And this is a really standard way of sampling insects. Um, and so we're looking at average number of adults per 10 tap samples. And so these are indeed low, but I think what's significant here is that you can see that we're only ever finding um, the adult psyllids on the pink clay once, which was in the month of September, which was at the end, right before we had another application of the product. So as the product is wearing off, but before that we have no detections in the pink and consistent detections in the untreated control and you may even be able to make an argument that the white clay uh, makes the tree more attractive. And what we think is going on there is that that white uh, background serves as basically illumination for the points of the tree that are grown out or the new growth points, which are very attractive to the psyllids. So uh, what we're finding overall is that this pink coloration is doing what we uh, hoped it to do, um, but there are um, other challenges to this. So this is kind of what this looks like in Ventura County, June bloom, as we uh, talked about before. So we've got the white clay over here on the uh, right hand side or left hand side and then on the right hand side, the pink. And so what you can see here is the new growth growing out of these treatments. So you'll see this like lots of green material. And what we think is happening is that that pink clay is really masking the presence of that new growth much better than the white. And we think that has to do with that changing of the, the color spectrum and um, the insect's ability to um, detect the tree at all. So of course, this is one month after treatment. So this is after one month, you have this much growth on these trees. And that, that can be a problem with keeping the treatment on. So like I mentioned, there's just issues to overcome. So anytime you're developing a tool for field use, this just is, it can be really complicated and for a lot of reasons. So we wanted this specifically to be an option for organic growers because they just don't have a lot of insecticides to choose from. And with the threat of the lethal disease, they need additional tools. Um, however, the dye we were using, we tried to get it through the organic certification process, but these things are very stringent. So now we're gonna try, um, powdered beets, and then also just pure iron oxide. Those are two things that should be organic certifiable, but in this first uh, two years of this study, we were not able to get an organic certified dye. So that's a problem for application. Um, and then the treatment, uh, how can that be removed from the fruit on the trees? This is a concern of growers, and we wanna make sure that we address this concern before promoting this tool because it can have economic effects for them. Um, and then on young trees, as you saw one month after completely grown out. So you're looking at trying to convince people to apply this every four to six weeks. And it's just fin not financially feasible. It just costs a lot of money to drive a tractor up and down a grove to apply a treatment and, and having to do it every four to six weeks, regardless of its, if it's more sustainable overall, just economically will not be sustainable. So I wanted to talk after these three examples of some of the other responsibilities that I have. Um, in particular, I spend a lot of time on regulatory meetings. So I give input on regulatory decisions. If they're gonna make a decision at the state level about say the Asian citrus psyllid or how to manage fine lumbing, I generally sit on those calls and provide scientific input to whatever strategies they are coming up with. Um, and like I showed you before, I'm responsible for those UC integrated pest management guidelines. And, and to do this, you need a deep understanding of how insecticides are used in the system. Um, mostly this is a uh, guideline used to recommend and help people reduce the use of insecticides by optimizing their use. So uh, you really need to know your insecticides for this job. 
Um, and then extension, uh, what I've found is that there's different challenges for communication with the growers versus the public. Um, and so I'm gonna share with you uh, um, a couple examples of specific extension tools. So the first one will be an application that we uh, developed. And then the second one will be about uh, SciComm at UCR, which is a student group on campus that I am the faculty mentor of and some of our activities there. Um, and this is all extension, by the way. So any type of communication that you're doing with the broader public will be considered extension. Um, so we developed this thing called the HLB app. And what the intention of this was, was to essentially give people access to the regulatory data to understand how close they are to the nearest HLB infection and to make recommendations about what they should or shouldn't do with their citrus tree. So um, this is kind of what the applet looks like this. We intended for people to bring it up on their phone. You can sort of type in your address here in this uh, top left box. Um, and when you hit enter, um, you are zoomed in to where you are. So I put in my office here. Um, and so what the app is telling me uh, based on my office is that I should remove and replace uh, the citrus tree with a non-citrus fruit tree because I'm within two miles of an HLB detection. And two miles is significant because um, essentially that's approximately the distance at which the Asian citrus psyllid can fly over the course of about two weeks. Um, so this is um, a tool that we developed to try to give people information on regulatory information. Uh, there's also one for growers, a uh, different version, but this is one that we share with the public and we use this as a tool to kind of um, build their investment or knowledge of the pathogen and connect it to their actual life and address and, and how they um, are living their everyday lives. They may or may not know whether there's uh, HLB near them or not. Um, I would say overall the pandemic uh, for communicating this has actually been helpful for me as an extension person because people are starting to really have a greater knowledge of epidemiology. And um, of course, this is nothing in comparison to COVID, uh, but it does help that everyone now has been trained to understand that things spread through contact and um, keeping your distance is important. Um, and so in this case, keeping your distance from the Asian citrusilid. So I also consider extension is working with the next generation of people that are interested in science communication. So I'm the faculty mentor of the SciComm group on campus. And so um, here is our website. Um, and the wonderful uh, student, graduate student members of this group put on all the types of events, which you can see here in the background, um, that are meant to educate people or give information on science communication. Um, there's a mentorship program involved with this, a blog, and then also a podcast that we uh, have uh, called Beyond the Bench, which I uh, oftentimes co-host. Um, and so this I all consider part of extension. And so uh, painting extension as, you know, it's just, you know, talking to agricultural uh, industry people, that's one part of it. But I think that it's important as extension people to reach out beyond that and to also, um, you know, if you're campus based, communicate with your people on campus and let people know what extension is because it can, uh, if someone is particularly interested in science communication, this can completely change uh, how they think of what they're gonna do with their PhD. So it's important to be exposed to. And so with that, I'm gonna thank uh, my lab team so this is my lab group here, and I will take any questions. I know I'm, I hope I'm not running too late. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen though. Thank you so much. It was super interesting. <laughs> I already have questions. <laughs> and yeah, um, I have a question. Uh, um, Regarding the bi biology, uh, you showed the picture with the dye you put on the trees. Does this affect um, the plant physiology? Because you change uh, the quality of light that reaches the plant and you, you might change the quality of the product at the end. So what we found is that that dye actually enhances the growth of the tree. And so what we're doing in addition to um, actually looking for the insect is measuring the photosynthetic rate and then also measuring the tree girth over time. And so what we found is the addition of that dye has actually enhanced plant growth. Um, I think this excites growers overall, but um, you know, that dye isn't without other challenges. And those other challenges really come um, from the insect community perspective. 
So when you cover the tree with that substance, um, biological control agents, they don't like that. Um, so you can have flares of other insect pests due to the treatment with that dye. So the reason I was trying to, well, that I wanted to share that example in particular is because anytime you're trying to do anything different or new, there are like 100,000 problems that you're going to run into uh, with the industry talking to you. And the insect community is also, you know, very sensitive to any sort of change. So luckily from the plant physiology side, to answer your question, we're all good. It enhances the growth. And we actually have a manuscript that's in the process of being submitted that shows that. Um, so it's really complicated <laughs> is what I would say. Easy on the plant physiology side, but complicated when it comes to uh, doing something significant that can change the way growers manage pests without insecticides.